I'm Sister Ann Keffer. Uh, I've been in this Eastern Synod for a little while, uh, and now I'm retired. I'm actually now in palliative care at Luther Village, receiving wonderful care. Scott. My name is Deacon Scott Kennard, and I serve the people of St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Kitchener through music ministry. I also facilitate Music for the Spirit, a program that deals with music and arts at Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. I'm Deacon Sherry Komen. I am the um, Deacon for Spirituality and Internet Outreach. I am based at Martin Luther University College, where I'm also the director of the Center for Spirituality and Media. And I'm Sister Michelle Collins. <clears throat> I serve as the assistant to the bishop in the Manitoba Northwestern Ontario Synod. I'm also a member of the Deaconess community with Sister Anne. And in this position, my portfolio includes uh, Synod Youth Ministry, Congregational Leadership Formation, Discipleship, and uh, Congregational Mission um, Visioning and Strategy. So as we begin our conversation today, maybe Sister Anne, you could give a bit of history of the diaconate in, in the Eastern Synod. Yeah, I, actually I just received some uh, fairly recently, some new information that I, did never know, I never knew before. And that is that what was called then the Canada Synod, in 1947, they had a convention and they had a deaconess committee. I was absolutely astounded. Uh, they talked about this deaconess committee, and, and I want to read up just a very little bit of what they said. Um, they, say, they talked about deaconess headquarters that wrote to them and said, our two mother houses cannot meet even a small fraction of the constant calls from congregations, social agencies, institutions, boards, and synods. Today we need, 1947, remember, Today, we need parish, institutional, and social welfare workers, church secretaries, youth leaders, teachers, nurses, and missionaries. Tomorrow will be here suddenly, and the tasks of tomorrow are colossal. 1947, <laughs> folks, 1947. Mm. And that was when Sister Florence Weicker began. Actually, let me talk a little bit first about the, the two houses that they were talking about, Philadelphia and Baltimore. These were the deaconess communities, uh, how two, two places that they, that they operated from. Philadelphia began in 1884, folks, and uh, uh, they focused on Lankanau Hospital. And in Baltimore, a couple of years later, started by the church for the church, they focused on parish work, um, secretaries, uh, all the kinds of ministries that one offers from a congregation. Sister Florence Weicker, to my knowledge, was the first professional deaconess in our synod. Um, and she started in 1947 and continued until 1972 at St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Kitchener. Actually, Kitchener, Waterloo was kind of a hotbed of deaconesses mm. for a little while. Um, uh, sister, um, they, they mostly had trained in Baltimore as had Sister Florence. Sister Sheila Radke served with St. Mark's, Sister Velma Pomeranke with St. John's, and Sister Helene Forler with St. Peter's. And there were many others, and some became pastors, some became wives. They couldn't serve with the deaconess community anymore because women only had one job at, in those years. Uh, and some just simply resigned. So um, we have a number. The early deaconesses in our synod served by being called by a congregation. 
Ginny Poff and Margaret Kreller, two deaconesses, were social workers. They found it almost impossible to be called into their profession in this place as deacons. The church saw the congregation as the only calling agency. Things have changed, thank goodness, as are proven by these colleagues of mine on this uh, Zoom call. People who are here in our synod are Pam Harrington, who is a member of the Lutheran Deaconess Association, is an independent therapist with a tie to a congregation. And both Scott and Sherry, members of the synod, bring a new and prophetic voice to the Eastern Synod. Thank God for you. I was set apart in 1964 and I served with St. Mark's following Sister Sheila Radke, who wasn't easy to follow. They loved her a lot. But also in the same area, Elfrida Hartig, a woman we must not forget, a woman who had done Sunday school by mail for many, many years in the West, came to St. John's and served as a parish worker. She and I would have lunch together and complain about our bosses, <laughs> and she was never formally named as a deacon, but I think her work was really diaconia. I want to note one other thing, and that is that three deacons have been nurtured by one congregation. I think that's pretty special. That congregation is Trinity Lutheran Church in New Hamburg. Sister Helene Forler, Deacon Sherry Coleman, and myself. In 1991, at the ELCIC convention in Edmonton, the decision was reached. This church shall have a diaconal ministry. I wept in joy. I almost collapsed. It was the first time any official church body had recognized and accepted my call. What is unique in Canada as a whole country, as the Canadian diaconal ministry began to take shape, thanks largely to the leadership of Pastor Richard Stetson, is that the Canadian roster of deacons includes all diaconal ministers. Those from the Lutheran Deaconess Association, which is an independent community originating in Valparaiso, Indiana, historical roots with Missouri Synod, but now very much split between uh, Missouri Synod and ELCA in the States, and I see here. The deaconess community and newly trained deacons. So these three strains of diaconia are all brought together in one roster. That's our Canadian way. Inclusion and, and support for one another and being small has its advantages. <laughs> Fast forward again to the 21st century. And in 2019, our LC, ELCIC made a bold decision to ordain deacons following the example of Lutheran churches in Europe and Africa and being in tune with Anglican colleagues who have ordained deacons for a very long while. Diaconia is the reason our church exists, any church exists. Diaconia is what brings us together as community. It is what Jesus lived and taught. Without diaconia, we become a hollow shell or a country. End of the history time. Those are fabulous, inspiring words. Thank you, Anne. Um, and also, every time I hear that history, I hear it anew, I have to say. 
um, uh, there's some piece of it that sticks out, but I just love your expressiveness. I'm wondering if you can share with us your personal faith journey to becoming, I mean, you have a little bit already, but uh, to becoming um, a deacon. Well, I think it started when I was about two or three years old. <laughs> my sister was asked by our dad, and my sister is nine years older than me, so she had this little kid that she loved very much. She was so glad to have a sister. Um, she was asked by our dad, um, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she was probably 11 or 12 at this time, maybe older. I don't know. She doesn't remember how old she was. And she answered, I want to be a teacher. Our mom was a teacher. And then she continued, she says, this is her story, not mine. And, and Anne, she's going to be a church worker. I know nothing about that story except what she tells me. I hope I can believe her. But my dad, as he did with Millie, asked me when I was about 13 or 14, what do you want to do when you grow up? And my answer was, I want to be a church worker. Mm. <laughs> and I don't know where that came from except mm. from the Spirit and Millie, who, with, through whom the Spirit worked. Um, then I went to Camp Edgewood. And I met a woman by the name of Sister Evelyn. And she wore shorts. She wasn't perfect, but she was fun. And I thought, well, if she can do it, I can do it. And my dad had already shown me a, pa a picture of her, actually, on a folder, a flyer that was advertising the Deaconess community, which was the only way for the women at that time in the 50s and 60s to be able to work in the church in a professional way. So I don't know where my call came from. It's been there all the time. The other story I tell is that when I was a little kid, mom had to keep on mit, uh, uh, knitting mittens because I kept losing one mitten because I would give them to some, one mitten away to somebody who didn't have one. Mm -hmm. And I only did that because we all had to carry lunch boxes on our big walk to, to school. And so one hand had to be covered and these kids were poor and they would lose mittens and I would give one away. That's another story told by my family. I think part of my DNA is diaconia. Mm. <clears throat> I would agree with that. <laughs> Scott, what is your faith story? Well, I come from a family of musicians and a family of musicians that hangs out in churches. So uh, even when I was the littlest of kids, um, I would be going from Lutheran churches to Catholic churches to Mennonite churches, making music in worship. And so growing up, that, that became a thing. And um, after many years as a church musician, I had a desire to express a voice that went a little bit beyond playing the keyboard. And uh, it seemed to me that life as a deacon uh, was a good expression of the diaconia that I was already expressing through my music and wanted to explore a little bit in other directions. I, I will say that, that you know, I, I share some of that in the sense that the ecumenical or the um, multiple denominational background or exposure. I was an Anglican, cradle Anglican, and um, grew up in the Anglican church and uh, came to this region, to the Waterloo region with my then partner, considered becoming a pastor, but the, the church wasn't where it is now around LGBT um, ordinations. Um, and so I had to... Um, redirect. And I, I began a ministry online and over time realized that was my call, part of my call, and that the being a deacon was a much better fit for what I was doing and what I wanted to do. Uh, so that's how I came to it. And I think for me, it's uh, the, the concise version is always a little bit hard, right? There's always more to the story than what can be summarized. But I grew up in, uh, my parents were missionaries in East Africa. And so I was really formed by this idea that your faith impacts your life. That was, right, like that was sort of a non-question. Uh, and so while I was baptized in the Lutheran tradition because of my mom's background as an early, as a young child, I was also invited to consider my own relationship with Jesus. 
And I remember having a really intentional conversation with my dad, sort of deciding that Jesus was going to matter to me, not just because I was a missionary kid, but because I really wanted Jesus to matter. And so throughout then my childhood, that was my internal angst was how can I make sure that Jesus really matters, (laughs) not just because of my Christian context, but because of my own conviction. Um, And so as a teenager, my like, you know, the song that really resonated with me, the the phrase was, um, I don't want to be a casual Christian, I want to light up the world with an everlasting light, right? So I just had this internal desire that this was going to be real for me. I wasn't just going to be another lukewarm person in the church. Um, fast forward through all sorts of young, you know, young adult angst. And um, I went to a Lutheran university because that's where I could get financial aid. But graduated from the Lutheran university really critical <laughs> of the Lutheran tradition for all sorts of reasons. Um, and then, and then I had a life tragedy that sort of left me without any resources to find my own way. And so I landed with my parents in the Lutheran congregation in their, in their community. Um, and really for the first time in a really long time had community that helped me heal, that helped me grieve, that gave me language for ambiguity and paradox and mystery that I didn't have before. And that allowed me to be imperfect. That led me to um, exploring seminary, not particularly because I felt a call to the church work professionally. I was never going to be a professional Christian, um, but I wanted to be a vital one. And so I needed to have my theological questions answered. Uh, And then in the context of seminary, I went to a diaconal ministry formation event where I met Sister Ann Keffer, who gave a presentation on um, world diaconia Mm -hmm. as a representative, uh, as part of her role in the deaconess community. And for the first time, I had this alternative expression of committed Christian other than the context that I had been formed in. Because of the diaconal movement around the world, there was another way of being an intentional community with, with a particular focus of service, grounded in spiritual, spiritual life, connected in community. Um, and that gave me a really dynamic alternative to um, the things that I was struggling with from my own origin story, so to speak. Um, And so I sort of landed in the Deaconess community as I stumbled my way through all the other expressions (laughs) of diaconal work um, with a particular emphasis and passion for revitalizing congregational faith formation and really helping the church recapture its vision to be um, not just a lukewarm community of social club people, but really that Jesus still matters to us, right? Still sort of is my, is my calling card. (laughs) There's something, Sister Anne, that I've really been wanting to hear more about, and and that's your time in Nova Scotia. I know that that was a number of years ago, but that instance of, of team ministry, how is it that they ended up calling uh, a deaconess in that context? Well, I wasn't so sure about it. (laughs) And they called me there for a year. And I ended up saying five. Um, So three pastors uh, addressed me at Synod Convention one year. And uh, they said to me, uh, these three people, these three men were, uh, at that time, it was only men as pastors. And they said, we need you in Nova Scotia. Will you come? And I said, well, I have just resigned from my parish at St. Mark's. Uh, yeah, I'll come. <laughs> I'm up for a, an adventure in Nova Scotia. And, and so I did go. The funniest thing about it was that these three guys said to me, and for this first six months, you don't do anything. I'm only there for a year, folks. <laughs> How can I do this? I, do nothing. No, no. And you go visit. You go listen, you go be. And they, they had been given a mandate by the Synod to close down preaching points, to close down smaller congregations that were no longer viable. And so what they had done for, I don't know if they'd been there for two or three years before I got there, but they had really gotten into the parishes and the congregations and they had uh, developed a really respectful relationship. And there were some 28 congregations and preaching points or more. And they had 
began to whittle them down. And so when I got there, there was like 18. And, and, um, but their problem was they could only preach and conduct worship. They, they didn't have time on a Sunday to do anything else. So anything else that met on a Sunday, like Sunday school or youth ministry, they could not be a part of. And that's why they needed me. And I went and I had a marvelous time. I got to say their advice was absolutely perfect. I did what they told me to do. I'm somewhat an obedient person most of the time, or some of the time anyway. And I did um, listen and I watched and I paid attention to uh, what was going on in the different congregations and the places of worship. And I worshiped with the people. I was going to four church services a day on Sunday. (laughs) And and, uh, different preachers, different sermons, sometimes duplicates. But anyway, I I learned to know the people. Um, And as I learned to know, I saw some of the areas of need. I was given a compliment that I won't ever forget. And that compliment was paid by um, a member of the Camperdown, uh, Cockerell Camperdown congregation, and they said, to, he said to me, he was the superintendent of the Sunday school. I offer, I finally offered a workshop, January. <laughs> I went there in September. January, I offered a workshop uh, for the teachers and they came. And this man said after the workshop was over, and you're the only one from upper Canada that we've ever heard that can meet us where we are. <laughs> wow. It was a great t- team ministry. The other part of that team ministry, other than working with three, three pastors, which I did, we met every Tuesday. Dick Tubby was our, our captain and he made sure that we did everything that we needed to do. And he sent in the reports because none of the rest of us were very good at that. But he was a great administrator for us. And um, we, we uh, planned a lot of stuff together such as Lenten services. And we would take a drama group all the way around all these different congregations. I remember one Good Friday, uh, Rolf Meindl became Jesus. I was I organized and produced the drama, and we held it in the high school in New Germany. And here is Rolf going out and calling the people in the congregation to come and follow him. He was Jesus, and then he we crucified him, and it was powerful. And the people will not forget that drama. I don't think. Um, we worked with the United Church people. We worked with the Anglican Church people. So it was always ecumenical. And and that was an amazing thing throughout my whole ministry. It's been ecumenical as well as teamwork. So I wonder, Sister Anne, if you can, uh, I mean, you've kind of talked about this a little bit, but what have been the variety of of expressions of diaconal work that you've done? And maybe you can sort of get us started and then um, others of us can share you know, because a, a deacon is more than one thing, right? And so what has being a deacon looked like in various ways throughout your work? And then maybe the rest of us can sort of answer that for ourselves. What does that look like for us? Okay. Um, I started out as a director of Christian education. Um, and, and that was at St. Mark's. And I was doing youth ministry as well. Um, and one of the things that happened at St. Mark's was... Um, the pastor and I actually had somewhat disagreement as to how youth ministry was. Because right now, right then, at that point, I was at the cusp of Luther League dying and youth ministry starting. And that idea of what youth ministry was was totally different than Luther League. The pastor was still in the idea of Luther League. So we, hmm. we kind of had some difficulty. So I did on my days off the youth ministry that I adored uh, with a uh, Uh, son of one of the pastors and a few other young adults and myself, we started a group, um, a coffee house called the Fat Angel. (laughs) It was up above a store at the east end of Kitchener. And we got uh, people to pay the rent for us because we didn't have any money. And Satan's Choice apparently had a a gathering across the street, which we didn't know about. We got um, things to uh, put into this place that didn't cost anything, like the great big spools that the uh, electric company used um, as tables and so on. And we would have entertainment every night. Well, the choice came up one night. I didn't know it was them. I invited them. They heard me call sister and, and they said, 
what does that mean? What are you? They're standing in the hall where they're not supposed to be in these big leather jackets. I don't know that it's Satan's choice. I just know they're guys, kids. Well, come back to the back and I'll tell you. So they followed me to the back, got the, out of the hall. And then as they turned, I saw the choice insignia on the back of one of the jackets and my knees went weak. <laughs> <laughs> Grabbed a hold of the, the, the coat rack and I said, oh, you guys are Satan's choice, are you? He said, yeah, we are. We're really free. I said, oh, no, you're not free. I'm free, but you're not free. <laughs> said, what do you mean you're not you're free? I said, well, I can do what I want, but you guys, whenever John, your captain, says anything, you have to jump to make it to obey. Not me. I don't have to do that. Oh, I said, look at you guys. You're Satan's choice. You've closed down every, every place that has a, a place for young people in these twin cities. If you're going to close this group down, Close it tonight so we don't have to spend any more time. What do you mean? Well, all of us are volunteers. We don't get paid for doing this. What? No, we don't get paid. So if you're going to shut us down, do it now. And the way you shut us down is to by bringing alcohol or drugs up here or causing a fight. Because we're going to have a cop up here every night. We're going to give him coffee. And he's going to be a part of our work. Well, they never shut us down. <laughs> They did not shut us down. <laughs> and, and I left to, to go to Nova Scotia. And um, they actually ended up, I think, buying a house. So the fat angel went a very long time. That's the kind of ministry I really enjoy. I also was a chaplain for university students and high school students at one point, both at UWO and in Regina. And I got a million stories about that one. Uh, I've also been... Um, uh, the director of a, an ecumenical center, which started in Saskatoon by a Roman Catholic priest. And, and the ecumenism is my heart, I think. I think that's part of my DNA and part of the diaconal call always uh, to work together as Christian churches. And not just that, but multi-faith as well. Um, I have a feeling that is about enough for me. Um, I must admit that that was a, a kind of a, an administrative call, but it had enough uh, teaching and, and uh, meeting one another that I enjoyed it very much. I was also the directing deaconess for the deaconess community. And I was also, um, uh, let me think, there was something else I wanted to say. I forget. <laughs> That'll be enough for now. Well, I would I would ask you to say mention also your TRC work in New Hamburg. Okay, um, that certainly has been a retirement project. Um, it's true, people in diaconia never totally retire. Once they retire from being paid, then they do what they their heart desires. And my heart desired being part of. And we started a small TRC team that has now been taken over by other group and other leadership. And I'm so proud of them. Um, we've done things like taking food to um, uh, a group at Six Nations that were uh, uh, standing in opposition to the land development. We've uh, stood beside our, Six or our indigenous people as we complained about what uh, the first prime minister of Canada did and how he had it's the first time I was ever part of a, a sit-in. And, and I found out later that our presence really mattered. These gray hairs had something to say to people and they stopped their swearing. They stopped their uh, driving past and, and with the finger. They, they stopped um, a lot of stuff that had been going on. I was just sorry we hadn't started sooner. But the TRC group in New Hamburg, there's two of them now. Uh, we now have a, um, an elder that comes to the Family Resource Center two or three days a week. And she has started a healing circle, women's healing circle. And would you believe they have asked me to come because they wish to drum for me. Mm -hmm. And I am so thrilled that I am being recognized and prayed for and tobacco being thrown into the fire for me mm -hmm. as I am ill. <laughs> so it's, it, it's even if you do start in one thing, you end up doing a lot of other things. I was also the Schmieder resident at the, the uh, uh, Lutheran Seminary in Saskatoon, where I taught seminary courses. <laughs> so who knows? 
it's, it's a variety of stuff. And you've just been an all around badass. Just a fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. I love it. <laughs> Always challenging us um, to, to rethink and to reconsider and to, to um, find new ways of um, being who we are. So. Thank you. And maybe that finding new ways, Sherry, maybe you can say something about how that uh, looks in your particular diaconal context. Sure. <laughs> um, so uh, so my, my, I came into my call kind of by, uh, sorry, I came into the work I'm doing sort of by accident. Um, I had been doing campus ministry in Toronto. I was not ordained. Uh, but I was included among the campus chaplain leaders at the, at the table of the chaplaincy committee. And I had a lot of trouble finding the Lutherans on the campus of the University of Toronto. They, I, I just couldn't locate them, really. So I discovered that my gift was maybe to provide space for ecumenical um, exchanges uh, among youth and among leadership. And um, my particular advocacy and interest at the time was prayer um, and wanting to increase our, our, uh, our, our ability to understand and know what we can accomplish with prayer and to understand the different ways that we pray. And so I created prayer vigils at the uh, Multifaith Center at the University of Toronto that were four or five, six hours long. And I asked the different groups the different ecumenical groups to sign up for an hour. And I provided the tea and muffins. And they, and I required that everybody come early by a half hour and leave by a half hour late so that we all could experience each other's hour and it wouldn't just be a silo. Um, and it went really well. We had themes around creation and, and um, uh, justice and all kinds of different general themes. And people, we had far, far reaching differences among us. And um, some of us were very nervous about others of us. And so um, I discovered that that mix was really interesting. And so I began experimenting with online prayer an online prayer um, community and uh, got hired to uh, become uh, someone who could actually work with an online ministry that had already begun, but it was a bit fledgling and it hadn't quite worked, which was a website where youth could write pieces and have them shared. And the website had lots of problems. So I took this in a different direction and suggested that I begin doing online devotions. And so in Lent of 2011, I put out my first online devotional project and it slowly grew. Um, from there, and we've just passed our 12th Lent. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so, so for me, um, I, I discovered as the ministry grew that people were reaching out to me, people were asking me questions, people were coming to me by email or messenger or whatever, the way someone might go to a pastor for questions. I also realized I had regulars and I had something that sort of felt a little bit like a parish in a way. And um, eventually, uh, I, my own sense of call was coming alongside a very strong feeling that the person doing what I was doing should be vocationally formed. And um, so that sense of responsibility to what I was doing uh, uh, sort of coincided with my own sense of deepening call. Um, so my, I guess I would characterize my, my mission as having been very much about deepening, uh, sort of working to help people deepen their, their spiritual lives and their, their, their own sense of faith formation. Um, and then when I actually got ordained and became a deacon and was located at Luther, uh, my other area of expertise, which is media and film came forward uh, and I suddenly realized I could sort of have a dream come true, which is to be working in all of my main areas of life. I'd been teaching media and film for years. Um, it could come together in a way that might help the church figure out 
how um, to use media as it does mission um, and to bring some expertise about media to that, as well as to be with and alongside the church as it explores its uses of media. And all of that coincided with the pandemic when all of this was becoming very, very acute in our, in our day-to-day uh, uh, community and worship life. Um, so that's it, I think. Yeah, so you use that phrase with and alongside, right, as, as part of your work. And I wonder, Scott, if in your work as a musician and as you sort of, if there's some connection with that, um, how do you see your work uh, being particularly diaconal? With and alongside, for sure. Yes. So um, directors of music are typically very narrowly focused. And I've never been particularly narrowly focused. So I didn't ever fit that particular. In fact, probably my diaconal work really began before I was even a member of the Lutheran Church in Montreal when I was helping Mennonite youth uh, visit soup kitchens and homeless shelters and and discover urban realities in downtown Montreal. And as part of that Montreal experience, um, I became very aware of of the Oka crisis and the... the, um, estrangement or distance between um, main, mainstream folks and Indigenous communities in this country. And so that was always sitting in the back of my mind as I started to go much later in Waterloo, as I started to go through my theological training, I was seeking a voice a voice to express my lived reality and connect with other people. And I knew from my musical training that music was a great medium to connect people and to build community. And I always had in the back of my mind this Indigenous a gap or the, the, the lack of connection and relationship with that particular community. And when we had occasion to go to Six Nations, that was like a light bulb going off. It's like, oh, th- this is the place and the time and the opportunity for connection. And so not only did I go to Six Nations and start learning about Indigenous spirituality and practices and, and needs and resilience, I also dragged my choir along. And so I was at Mount Zion Waterloo at the time. I said, hey, what if we go down and sing for an Anglican church service? And they were like, yeah, okay, where is that? How do you get there? What would we do when we're there? How, how will that work? Is this going to be scary? Um, and, and so there was very much a, a ministry of accompaniment, of, of making it accessible, of finding a way to enter a community that seemingly was not um, probably for most people welcoming or, or accessible. And sure enough, we went, we sang, we had a great lunch afterwards, everybody got to know people, and the thing just snowballed from there. And before I knew it, we were having regular exchanges with various churches in various communities. uh, And somehow I was, um, I don't know, you could say a cog. I, I was one of the little gears that stayed oiled and and well-tuned to the various communities to help that cohesion and that understanding and communication occur so that relationships may begin to form. You've got to know that Scott was one of my mentors in all of this. (laughs) Didn't you get that backwards, Sister Anne? You gave me that beautiful porcelain foot washing bowl in that memorable ordination service at St. Paul's Anglican on uh, Sour Springs Road. And just being present on the territory with an Anglican bishop and the Lutheran bishop and all our Lutheran friends and all of our Indigenous friends, uh, that was just such an incredible day. So a lot of my... So a lot of my work has been, uh, you know, more in within the congregation. At least, at least it looks like it's within the congregation. 
But when I first became um, a deaconess, when I first joined the community, my passion was really early childhood education. And I really had this vision of working with young children, largely because of my relationship with Sister Ginger Patchen and Sister Val Sander, two other Canadian deaconesses or deaconesses in Canada. And so I saw their, the way that they lived out their ministry to young children. And as I was reflecting on my own growing understanding of Lutheran theology, and I saw like the, the um, influence that we could have if we lived into our baptismal promises that we make when we surround young children. And so I had this vision of helping congregations sort of see the children in their midst in a different kind of way, rather than on the, on the margins, really moving the early childhood spiritual experience into the center of how they understood themselves as community. As I experienced Lutheran congregations with connected preschools and, um, and just wanted to help congregations reimagine themselves as multi-age, multi-generational, whole communities um, where this language of faith actually activates and actually influences. So my first congregation, um, when I was called to a congregation, they said, we want a youth director. And I said, I am not your person because I'm not a program person. I'm not going to keep the youth in the, hall, you know, the, in the room down the hall. I'm not going to segregate ages. I'm not going to do big entertainment things. But if you want someone to help you sort of revision your whole community and the place of children and youth in the, in the context of that whole community, then I can help you with that. So as I started doing that, then I realized children are influenced by the adults around them. And so if I want to influence children, I've got to start influencing adults, which led me into leadership formation and leadership development, sort of seeing the whole congregational system and the the misconceptions that we have around children and youth programming that have led us into some segregation or separation that isn't particularly helpful in um, faith formation. <laughs> so, so while I right, like while I do a lot of children and youth ministry, it's still um, driven by this idea of of listening to different kinds of voices, listening to to those that we tend to um, overlook in the first you know, in the first pass. And so in that way, um, I think that's how I would sort of make some diaconal connections to my work. <laughs> and Michelle, you have such an incredible gift for revisioning. <clears throat> or you, you are, and, and you've been more recently helping the diaconal community uh, to sort of listen to ourselves and our, our understanding of who we are and think about the future of the church yeah, um, I, I, that's something we should talk about, the future of the deacons in the church. Uh, I also know that we want to talk perhaps about the relationship between ordination and consecration and what, uh, what that means. Yeah, I wonder if Sister Anne, who, as one who lived through that, if you can just sort of walk us through your experience of that, um, of, of that process and how it impacted you, right? Like your understanding of yourself. Um, how was that shifted by this conversation the church was having? Somewhere in the 1980s, I wrote a chapter for a book, and I can't find the book anymore. I'm giving it away again. <laughs> but the chapter I have still on my computer, and it starts with, I have been ordained. <laughs> so I believe very clearly that three rosters, three calls, to very different ministries, but still of the church and in the church, bishop, pastor, deacon, uh, were very similar and should be treated in, in that way. But because I believe the diaconate started with women and they were second class, you know that, I know that. And then we did service ministry, not in front of the congregation, but with and underneath the congregation. We provided leadership, we provided training, we provided the motivation to serve like Jesus did. And why was Jesus crucified? Well, my theory says Jesus was crucified because he was a deacon. <laughs> I've never said that before. I do think that diaconal service is really hard because Nobody wants to be the underdog. Nobody wants to be the one that is 
serving everybody else, not as a slave, not as a as an as an as an under underling, but serving as Jesus did. And we have to, as diaconal people, we have to keep that in mind, or we'll go crazy or stop. Ordination. Well, as I said, in the 1980s, I was bold enough to have it in print. I have been ordained, and people in this church knew me. And so my sense was that what is ordination, except the laying on of hands in the midst of the people in a call from the church, and the spirit is present, the prayers of the people. Well, if that's ordination, that's what happened when I was set apart. That's what happened when the other women were consecrated, when you were consecrated, Michelle. We may be used different terms, but the actual action was the same. And so when this ELCIC started, I was asked to be on the board for leadership and education in th and theological education. Detail, we called it. And as a member of that board, I asked them to, and they said, okay, you do it, Anne, <laughs> to have a, a study of ministry that would then lead to some inclusion of the diaconal uh, ministry. And so we did. And as I have referred before, in 1991, this little task force went to that convention with an incredible uh, um, uh, reference, a, an incredible study, results of their study. And I was part of that study. And it, it put the three orders in tandem and said they should all be ordained. Well, we had some pundits amongst us who checked it out with the rest of the people in the synod or in the convention, not synod, but the, the national church. And they said, that's not going to fly. So if we want anything to fly, we got to do it simply. So that's why the motion was that there be a diaconal minister. Then, as I said, in 19 or in 2019, our church changed it from consecration, setting apart to ordination. And the uh, committee that was responsible for that has created a document, FOD. And if anybody remembers the, the right words for that, I'd like to hear it. But the FOD group came to the diagonal group that was meeting across the church in Winnipeg that year. And they said, this is what we want to do. We want to hear from you. They heard. They heard the pain of being consecrated, that pain of being second class. And that's how it was perceived. And they said, this is not right. And so their, um, their work has led to the ordination of deacons. I could not be bothered being second class, honestly. I just didn't. And so for me, I just happened to come along in the pipeline as the next person after that motion was passed. It, Right, just happened to be the next person, and so, as the as the first person who was in this context being termed ordained, um, it was so extraordinary to have Anne present. Not only Anne present, but um, but also uh, putting her hand on my shoulder as as uh, as it was all taking place. So there was a I, I felt so beautifully accompanied and also um, sent in the sense of the apostles, right? The sending out, um, and that was also at Trinity, New Hamburg. So, yeah. And the other thing that has occurred has been our church has made the motion that all those who were consecrated or setting up, set apart in the previous years would now be considered ordained. And I appreciated that very much. Michelle, where are you in all of this? Well, I think, <clears throat> so Sister Anne was at my consecration um, as the directing deaconess of the community. And I think one of the things I've always um, taken from your time in that, in that role, Sister Anne, is that we were called to the whole church, right? You always made it really clear that this was a call from the church to the world. Um, and, and that really impacted how I understood myself, right? And so um, 
that it was never, it, yeah, that there was always this broader um, call to the, you know, broader beyond our own boundaries is something that I've always sort of taken from, from you and learned from you. And I appreciate a lot. Scott, you were part of that whole the development of the document for 2019. You were very much involved in that. Thank goodness. You were our diagonal voice in the process. Well, I wasn't actually the only one. As, as Sister Anne said, all of the deacons uh, participated in that listening event in Winnipeg. And at the time when we gathered in Winnipeg, um, it was Deacon Gretchen Peterson, who was the deacon on the Faith, Order, and Doctrine Committee. So, so Gretchen had a piece there, and then she handed it off to me, and I continued on and helped with some of the writing of that document, which is still available. The Reimagining Our Church document is, is something that gives a place to deacons in a way that perhaps was not articulated before, and also calls on the collegiality of working across um, all all uh, baptized members of the church. And well, I think, and I think it goes back for me, it goes back to something else that Anne said earlier about in, in this church in Canada, there's one roster of deacon that sort of want, braids together, uh, you know, the Lutheran Deaconess Association members, the Lutheran Deaconess or the Deaconess community members and the diaconal ministers. And so in some way I see that that's what ordination has done, right? Like it is, it has allowed us to sort of braid our ministries into one unified expression of what it means to be called. And, I, and coming from the ELCA, I think that's the gift of what that action took for the previous roster, diagonal rosters, is that it calls us into oneness, which I think is all sorts of Trinitarian, but also really important as we wrestle with what does it mean to, to find unity in community, right? <laughs> <laughs> while, value, while valuing diversity. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate what you just said because it's very true that the act of ordination being same across orders does impact us as deacons as well within our community. Um, certainly, when I attended my formation event in 2012, um, there was a diversity within the gathering. And it was at times quite confusing what that diversity of terms, some are sisters, some are not sisters, some are deaconess, some are not deaconess. What does this all mean? <laughs> well, and I think that maybe, I mean, not to, not to sort of take someone else's role, but I wonder what that helps us imagine about the future of the diaconate in Canada. Um, how, how might we envision this decision, because I, I firmly believe that this decision will impact the next generation more than it impacts us. We are still navigating what, you know, the, the, the particular impacts on our histories or whatever, but I wonder what it's going to mean for the next generation um, who's sort of brought up in this church that ordains, you know, the three uh, equally, like what difference is that going to make, do we imagine, for the diaconate? And, and, I want to get one word in here before we answer that, because I've said this before in a paper that I wrote, but I want to say it here. And that is, I don't think any of us as deacons, deaconesses, whoever we are in the diaconate, um, I don't think we need to be ordained. I think what needs to happen is our ministry needs to be ordained. Mm. Our ministry needs to be seen as not just valid, but leaders in the future of this church. Um, I still think that our churches have dwindled because we have not responded to Jesus' call. Jesus never said, go worship. Jesus said, go do, go serve. I, <clears throat> I personally think that there's the possibility for the, the diaconal community to only grow in the future because I think it will become increasingly one of the more attractive areas. Um, in the sense of, of being on that edge between the church and the wider world. I think as, as you know, we experience the transformation of the church, the decreasing numbers, the merging of congregations, the ways in which congregations, partly because of the pandemic, have shifted their ways of expressing community in terms of trying to be both um, together in a building and also 
online and doing other forms of ministry is going to increase an understanding that the church is very diverse in its expressions. And so how do we come together as the church? I think deacons can play a real role in helping to guide that conversation um, and be with and alongside it. I'm amazed at what I'm hearing from different congregations and how much the congregations are now looking to say, who can we serve? They're, they're doing investigations of neighborhoods around themselves. They're looking at how their buildings and lands can be used. A congregation in St. Philip's in Kitchener sold their um, building to indigenous people for their center for a very small amount of money. Um, and, and St. Mark's has sold its building to, to be able to have a, um, um, an outreach, an incredible outreach in the city. So I think that we're catching it. I think we have to. <laughs> and like you said, I mean, I really like what you said, Sister Anne, about the ministry, right? It's not the individuals. And I think as, as we as deacons allow for the diaconal ministry to be the, the, the emphasis or the point, I think that's, like you say, Sherry, that might impact, that might draw people to the diaconate particularly, but will it will also expand the diaconal work of the church, which is, I think, what we what we want, right? We we particularly feel compelled to participate in that work, but it's not only our work, it's the work of the whole church. I was thinking uh, deeply about what I want to have happen. I do want our ELCIC deacons to come together in some form of community because I think many voices are fine and, and differing opinions are wonderful and we cannot do without them. And as I have behind me that little ampersand, um, and we need to come together with one voice sometimes. We have a ministry. We've been given a call. And in that ministry and in that call is the future of the church. I, there is no doubt in my mind that if the church is not a diaconal church, it will once again fail. Not just diaconal, but multi-faith. I know I'm a bit of a heretic. <laughs> I've been called worse names. And I believe deeply within my heart as I've worked with, with indigenous folk that we never brought God to this country. We never brought God to Turtle Island. God was already here. They knew the creator and have continued to know the creator, as have the Buddhists and the Hindus and the Muslims and all of the major religions and those that aren't so major of this world. God is many forms to many people. We cannot minimize who God is, or as has been written, our God is too small. This God of ours is huge. I've been through a lot in the last few months. People say that about me. I, I'm not so sure, except I did everything as it came. I had some time of, of um, being um, actually immobilized, two arms and a leg that I couldn't move. And that still bothers me. I'm still not moving them all that well. My ability to talk never stopped. <laughs> <laughs> my thinking never stopped. And my love never stopped. And I was treated with love everywhere that I went. But through all of that, I got to say, God and I have had some struggles and we will continue. But I still say this God is big, bigger than you and me, bigger than our ministry, bigger than church, bigger than Christianity.
oh, if we could only incorporate all of that in our worship, in our thinking, in our action. Scott, take it from here. We didn't practice this. Where should we go? <laughs> We've been so many places. <laughs> I just remember that that gathering in uh, on Six Nations when we brought the ecumenical community together with the traditional people, and we were thinking about the TRC calls to action, and we said, "What can we do? What can we do?" And the Haudenosaunee people invited us to to clear our eyes and clear our nose and clear our ears and clear our throats so that we could speak together in a good way. And I'm sure you remember too, Sister Anne, when you came forward and you probably didn't even know quite what you were going to do. And your hands just came up offering the space to our neighbor. And, and then spontaneously, everyone in the room just was standing with you in a way that the spirit moved. And I think that diaconia has this sense of feeling the spirit of the times, the spirit in the room, how the spirit is moving in our hearts and minds and convicting us to put new ideas forward and be together as one, as one mind, as one community, uh, across our differences. And again, that moment, it just speaks really strongly to me. So I've been reflecting this morning as we've been talking, and there's quite a lot of breeze going and, and the breeze comes in and out. And it just, I don't know, this is not at all the topic, but it, it for me, this sense of spirit and community is something that I have felt strongly in the ELCIC diaconal community, in your ministry among us, in the way that I was welcomed in as, as a candidate and, and just embraced even before I went through any kind of formal study or anything. Um, and yeah, I just, I just wanted to say that, that, we can sense when the spirit is working among us and it's just such a really good thing. So I hear in your voice and in your sharing today, that, sen that same sense of spirit, and I'm feeling it in the breeze in the room where I am. I just want to pick up on something you said about uh, that you both have said about being alive to the moment and being aware and responding to what's going on. I know with the Lutherans Connect ministry that when in the early days I was, I was just I was sort of following a, you know, a series of plans I had made, got shaken up with the, the tsunami in Japan or something. I can't remember when it was. And I realized I can't not respond to that. And so the next day I changed what I had planned and I did something different that was focused on that. And there was a response from people. And I suddenly knew that actually, I was only gonna be able to be vital with this ministry if I did them the day before. And that's how I continue to do them because then I'm actually able to hear the spirit, you know, the, the breezes that come through our prayers that, that sort of caused me to sort of think twice about my own ego needs that thing I wanted to show off that I know or I can do and go, oh, no, we have to do this now. We, there's something going on. We have to respond. We have to, we have to sort of invite people to pray into that situation. I think that is, um, you know, there was something at the worship conference last year. There was that image of the porch, the front porch. Mm -hmm. And I think in some way of deacons as being the front porch of the church, kind of walking on and off going out and sometimes stepping right away from the church to go into the community, sometimes bringing the community right into the church and, and working in the church. Um, but there's something about being on the porch, you're maybe forced to pay attention to the breezes and to the, the, the spirit and the winds of change that are sort of nudging us into new and different directions. 
I'm going to say also that for myself, I want us to really, all of us remember that there are so many people out there who cannot, don't have necessarily a community. Uh, so many Lutherans Connect followers are not actually part of faith communities. Um, and they found this online, right? There's a world beyond the borders that we're used to that also needs us. One of the things that I hear in, um, I think in what what all of you are sort of saying is this this hope, this vision for the diaconal voice to claim itself. If that's, I'm not exactly sure if that's the way, but one of the things I I appreciate about um, what I have learned from you, Anne, is uh, that your dream for the deacons to claim who they are and who they can be for the sake of the work that we do, right? That you've always challenged me and I think others who have been impacted by you to, um, you know, what you just said, right? Like there are times when we need to bring our voice together, right? That, that we like to sort of, we like to have opinions. We like to be responsive. We like to evaluate what's going on, but not always do we feel empowered to participate in the conversation or in fact to say we can lead the conversation. And so um, as it relates to diaconia, I, 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 I hear in you this dream that the deacons will sort of claim our authority and our voice to um, not not claim like not keep the word to ourselves, but share the ministry with the whole church, um, and you know to sort of claim our space in that. I think is really convicting to me. The constituting convention of the I'm not sure I'm being heard. But the const I'm going to get closer. At the constituting convention of uh, the ELW, I guess it was, I asked, I was a guest speaker, one among many, I asked everybody who was in the, 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 the group who were ministers to stand up and the pastors stood. The people did not. Before too long, I had them all standing <laughs> and I said, you are all ministers. And I think that's our job. Part of our job is to say to the people of this church, the pastor is not the leader only. Mm. We are all part of diaconia. We are all ministers. We all need to move together. And Can you so, imagine what difference that would make in our communities if congregations were filled with people who felt empowered to name their ministerness? <laughs> yes. And, and I think we, as as diaconal people because people trust us in a way they don't the pastor because the pastor is very often in our church because of our german roots here pastor and i know that's re de receding or getting dis distanced and, and less but it's still part of the roots and we've got to change that we have to stop being a clerical centered church and become a spirit centered church mm. Amen. Spirit centered, not just people, but spirit centered. It comes back to, sorry. It comes back to that the, the priesthood of all believers. Um, what does that actually mean? And what does it mean in our contemporary context and um, the ministry of all believers? Yeah. I think I will. I will hope that we all can continue to be capable of the intense passion and energy that you have, Anne, for proclaiming what we have to do. <laughs> that, is, that is one of the greatest gifts that you've given to me is that, that sense of being able to say, uh, without stopping to think of first about it as who's going to hear this and what will they think and but to be able to say, this is what we have to do. This is, this is our job as a diaconia and also um, as deacons. Um, so I'm going to carry that voice. Thank you. So maybe as we, as I sort of sense this conversation coming to a close, if that's okay, um, <clears throat> I just wonder as, as, like I said before, right, as one of the younger people in this circle, um, I came into the Deaconess community really wanting and yearning for a legacy to participate in. 
I really um, was feeling all sorts of disconnection with my own, you know, with my own history and, and, and story. And I needed a new story to connect to. And so in the Deaconess community, I found this legacy of women who had lived radically, who had lived passionately, who had lived from a place of conviction. Um, and I was not that. I was not passionate. I was not radical. I was not convicted. <laughs> and, and I just... I wanted so badly to be inspired by women whose stories would then form and inform mine. Um, and so I just want to say, Anne, that yours has been one of those stories that as you have lifted up the history of the deaconesses, of the history of women who have come before you, um, and as you have invested in those of us who are coming after you, um, I have been formed and informed by, by the legacy that you've participated in. And so I'm really, really humbled by that, right? I'm humbled by your confidence that this, that this work can continue, that, that you trust those of us who are younger to carry it on, and that you believe that we have what it takes to, to do the work. And so I think that's really important. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm humbled for my, for my name now to be um, in community with yours and, and whose story is now formed and informed by your story. So I just want to say thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. As somebody who does work that's largely in a silo, you have really encouraged me to think in terms of community um, and to always be mindful of the community, whatever community that might be. My work does go out to a community, but the, the work I do is in the privacy of my own room a lot of the time now not so much when i'm at the college but so i i i'm so grateful to you for modeling and and encouraging me to widen and deepen my sense of what community is unity has been and probably always will be of, of prime importance to me Teamwork, um, the ability to hear differences and love them, um, yeah, and to be a part of one another. The body of Christ, I guess. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You have done some very hard work. And we haven't talked about the story of a directing deaconess. <laughs> But I know that there was a lot of work and energy expended at great expense to, to your well-being at the time. And so seeing how you spent your retirement years flamed with passion for Indigenous peoples to the point of organizing that group in Wilmot Township to achieve something that no one else could imagine going on. Um, it, it was just so inspiring as someone else doing work with Indigenous communities uh, to see the effort and passion and willingness and stubbornness and perseverance and all of those wonderful characteristics that were on display, whether it was at a protest or coming before uh, a council with a recommendation or, you know, it was just really an encouragement to my own to see others uh, bringing these issues forward. Uh, thank you for accompanying my work and my journey to Diakonia. It's been a blessing for me and will continue to be. There's some Kleenex here. I may have to. <laughs> your words and your sentiments are more than I could have imagined, and I thank you for them. The work of diaconia will never be done. And that's the joy, the blessing, and the difficulty. We can't close the door and say, oh, that's done. As much as I'm no longer able to be active as a leader, I still think my presence as a diaconia person makes a difference. 
and yours does too. You're right. I can't do a whole lot of stuff that I used to do. But I can watch you guys do it. <laughs> and joy in what you are doing and how you are doing it. May God give you the strength and the passion to stay who you are, to continue to be wide open to all kinds of opportunities and challenges. The challenges are great. The opportunities are great. The blessings are more than any one of us can hold. God is with you. Peace be yours. <clears throat> and with you, Anne. Thank you. Let us pray. O oh God, through the ages you have called women and men to the diaconate in your church. Let your blessing rest now on all who answer that call. Grant them understanding of the gospel, sincerity of purpose, diligence in ministry, and the beauty of life in Christ, that many people will be served and your name be glorified. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.